Cleveland is a city without which you wouldn't have ever heard my name. Because? Dr. Sam Shepard. F. Lee Bailey, Sam Shepard's attorney, walks on the beach with us, not too far from the spot where Shepard said he fought on the beach with the so-called bushy-haired man, the man Shepard always said killed his wife Marilyn. At 86, Bailey walks a little slower than he once did, but his mind remains as quick and sharp as ever. And you're convinced that what Sam said happened on this beach is what happened on this beach? I would bet my life on it. On the morning of July 4th, 1954, Marilyn Shepard, 31 years old and pregnant with the couple's second child, was found brutally beaten to death in an upstairs bedroom of the Shepard's lakefront home in Bay Village. Shepard said he awoke in the night from napping on a daybed downstairs to hear his wife screaming and raced upstairs where he first encountered what he later described as the bushy-haired man. Knocked down, Shepard says he chased the man out onto the beach behind his home. You are standing on the back of the Shepard property for the first time in over 50 years? Yes. Bailey, a former Marine pilot, would go on to represent the alleged Boston Strangler and later O.J. Simpson, among many other famous defendants. His reputation, though, was first made here in Cleveland, representing Sam Shepard. It was a case like no other and still remains at the top of my memory. Taking us to key places connected to the case and during a wide-ranging interview in our studio, F. Lee Bailey paints a picture of a case that to this day remains misunderstood. To start with, he was not contacted by the Shepard family to represent Sam. He was first contacted by a reporter named Paul Holmes, who wrote a book entitled The Shepard Murder Case. Holmes, a lawyer himself, covered the first Shepard trial in 1954 for the Chicago Tribune, where Shepard was convicted of killing his wife. Judge Edward Blyton reading the verdict. Guilty of murder in the second degree. The run-up to the 1954 trial included sensational press headlines, many pointing a finger at Sam Shepard. And the trial itself was conducted in a carnival-like atmosphere, what the U.S. Supreme Court later referred to as bedlam. Reporters roamed throughout the courtroom during the trial, and jurors' names were even printed in the paper. Holmes finished his book by calling Shepard's conviction a damn shame. And at the end of the book, I was angry and in awe. So when Paul Holmes came to see me, I said, sure, I'll go talk to him. First, though, Bailey met Sam's brother, Steve, who took him out on Lake Erie and taught him to fish. And every member of the Shepherd family I met, they just seemed like good, solid Midwestern people who had no motive for the kind of, of violence that was involved in Marilyn Shepard's death. Was your sense immediately that there was an injustice, or did you think he may have done this? My whole question was, is the Holmes book right? If it is, this should be fixed. They get the wrong guy in jail. Bailey then went with Steve to the prison. I went eye to eye with Sam. After an hour, I said, I'll get you out. How could you be confident that you could get him out? Because I was a cocky Marine. But much more importantly, I felt the law had changed substantially and the things that bedeviled Sam in 1954 were gone or even upside down. Over a few years, it had become easier to get a federal court to review a state court conviction such as Shepard's. But Bailey wasn't even brought in at first to appeal Sam Shepard's conviction. Instead, he was here because he was an expert who could supervise a lie detector test, one that had tremendous media interest. True Magazine funded it. They had a crackerjack examiner to run it. And at the last minute, Ohio said no. Bailey had a contentious meeting with Louis Seltzer, the powerful editor of the Cleveland Press that had led the sensational media coverage. Seltzer wouldn't support a polygraph test. If Shepard had passed, it would bolster the case that he'd been wrongly convicted of killing Marilyn and possibly expedite his release from prison. Bailey also met with Ohio Governor Mike DeSalle. The governor told me, I don't care if the guy's innocent, he's not getting a test because Louis Seltzer would boil me in oil. I'd never get elected again. The governor of Ohio told you that? Yes, yeah, so I sued him. Sam Shepard never wound up taking a polygraph test. None of his offers to take one has ever been accepted, and you are right. Bailey's lawsuit failed, the court's ruling no one has a right to a lie detector test. So then Bailey attacked the conviction itself in federal court, eventually reaching the U.S. Supreme Court. Bailey argued the judge's failure to shield the jury from prejudicial news coverage rendered the 1954 trial constitutionally unfair. And what did Bailey tell the U.S. Supreme Court? I said the only thing that matters here is the headlines. Please 
Look at them. The U.S. Supreme Court is a serious place. Bailey, though, wanted to show the Justice's Cleveland newspaper headlines that he'd had blown up into huge posters. He asked the court clerk about it before the justices came in. And he said, I think it would be all right, but there's only one way to find out. I'm not going to go back and ask them. So I flashed him. It wasn't a long show, but it certainly got their attention. We will seek a new trial. By an 8-1 to one vote, the U.S. Supreme Court sided with Bailey and Shepard, ruling the 1954 trial had been unfair. It is necessary that we again present this matter for a jury determination. And a key moment in the second trial would come when F. Lee Bailey asked coroner Sam Gerber about his 1954 testimony, where Gerber told the jury the murder weapon was most likely a surgical instrument. Sam Shepard was a surgeon. You were not 100% sure what he would say when you asked him what surgical instrument. You're exactly right. Was F. Lee Bailey bluffing with Sam Shepard's life, or did he know something? That story when we continue. Sam Shepard, Case Closed. Bill Scheel, Fox 8 News. Did you intend to uh, yell not guilty quite that loud, Sam? I've yelled it ever since I was arrested. Dr. Sam Shepard screamed that just after the verdict was read at his second trial in 1966, where he was found not guilty of the brutal 1954 murder of his pregnant wife, Meryl. At his first trial back in 54, Shepard had been convicted and spent the next 10 years in prison. And then his family hired a young lawyer, a former Marine pilot, who would go on to become one of, if not the most famous criminal defense lawyer of the 20th century, F. Lee Bailey. Your career really broke out here, right? Uh, without Sam Shepard, it might never have broken out. We walked with Bailey on the beach in Bay Village, not too far from where Sam Shepard said he fought on the beach with what he later described as a bushy-haired man. The man Shepard always said beat his wife to death. Bailey, now 86, remembers meeting Sam in prison. When I look this guy in the eye, are his eyes going to tell me he killed his wife or his eyes going to tell me no? It took me about 15 minutes to decide, Sam, I know you've lost 11 appeals and I'm just a young lawyer, but I am going to get you out. Bailey appealed Shepard's conviction into federal court, arguing massive publicity, much of it pointing a finger at Sam Shepard, led to an unfair trial in 1954. He argued the judge, Edward Blythen, failed to insulate the jury during the trial from the coverage, so that in the end it wasn't clear if the jury convicted Shepard based on what they had heard in court or what they had read in the papers. The appeal went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. The failures and repeated failures of the entire system so far as control of the lawyers and the judge and the police are blatant and repeated, and I think that these primarily cost Dr. Shepard any chance of a fair trial. By an 8-1 to one vote, the high court agreed. In preparing for the second trial, though, Bailey didn't shun reporters. In fact, he talked openly to them. With all that has been published in Cleveland about this case, it's very difficult to find anybody who doesn't know something about it. Bailey knew that during the second trial, the judge would keep the jurors much more focused on just the evidence presented in court. But he also knew outside of court, ahead of trial, they'd be reading the papers and watching TV news and he didn't want prosecutors to be the only ones quoted in the press. To keep minds open that are fit to sit in a jury box, you so have you, to spark back. So you were trying to keep minds open in part by talking to the press? Yes, indeed, because the prosecution had told the press its story many times and they said he was a killer. And I said, I must remind you, he is not until he's proven one and that's not gonna happen. At trial, Bailey attacked the credibility of the state's star witness, coroner Sam Gerber, who had testified at the first trial that the murder weapon was a surgical instrument. Gerber sounded confident ahead of the second trial. We have the same evidence as we had before. We have the same people available, and we can go to trial tomorrow. You did not know exactly what Dr. Gerber would say when you asked him, have you found the surgical instrument? You're exactly right. But I was sitting in the lawyer's catbird seat. I didn't care what his answer was. By 1966, the law had changed dramatically about what prosecutors had to provide to the defense ahead of trial. I knew that he couldn't produce the instrument because if he had, they'd have had to turn it over. Times changed a lot. Back in 1954, they didn't have to turn it over. Dr. Gerber had testified that the murder weapon left a bloody impression in a pillow. Bailey to Gerber at the second trial, quote, 
Would you please tell the jury what surgical instrument you see impressed in that pillow? Gerber. I can't give you the name of it because I don't know what it is. Later, Bailey. You know Sam Shepard is a doctor, don't you? Yes. And you knew it at the time you testified at the first trial? Yes, sir. And you testified then it was a surgical instrument? I did. And you never produced one, did you? No, sir. And later, Gerber. I hunted all over the United States and I couldn't find one. He lied? He lied. When he said that's a surgical instrument, he had no picture in his mind of any surgical instrument. And is that the turning point? That was an important point because it showed some wrongdoing on the part of the prosecution. Other than that, there just was a paucity of evidence implicating Sam. Bailey also kept Sam Shepard off the stand. He was a bad witness for himself in 1954, vague in his account of what happened, and forced to admit under oath that he lied about having an affair with a nurse named Susan Hayes. Again, by 1966, the rules were different than what Shepard had faced at his 1954 trial. It could be argued against him that his silence was consciousness of guilt. That was not the law 12 years later. I could not have afforded to put him on the stand in his condition. He was drinking too much. I suspected some kind of pills. Bailey also tried his case towards the younger jurors and thought many of them might be fans of a popular TV show of the day. The Fugitive. Based on the Shepard case, the fugitive followed a doctor falsely accused of killing his wife who was on the run trying to find the so-called one-armed man who was the killer. Bailey had worried about the prosecutor bringing up the show during jury selection. I was scared to death John Corrigan was going to discover who watched The Fugitive and who didn't and take them off because everybody knew The Fugitive was innocent. The jury came back in 12 hours, not guilty. Afterward, Shepard said he planned to follow up and try and prove who killed Marilyn. A cloud of doubt always hung over Sam Shepard. But more than three decades later, Sam and Marilyn's bodies were exhumed, and their only child, Sam Reese Shepard, would try to use new DNA technology to establish his father's innocence. The result? Another shocking verdict. That story next on Sam Shepard, Case Closed. Bill Scheel, Fox 8 News. The first two Sam Shepard trials reached exactly opposite verdicts. Convicted in 1954 of the brutal murder of his pregnant wife, Marilyn. Guilty of murder in the second degree. Shepard spent the next 10 years in prison before his family hired a young lawyer who would go on to become one of the most famous criminal defense attorneys of the 20th century, F. Lee Bailey. Dr. Sam Shepard was a legendary international cause. It was also considered an impossible case. Bailey appealed Shepard's conviction to the U.S. Supreme Court won a landmark decision that the judge's failure to insulate the jury from sensational press coverage made the first trial constitutionally unfair, then won the 1966 retrial where Shepard was found not guilty. Did you intend to uh, yell not guilty quite that loud, Sam? I've yelled it ever since I was arrested. Despite the not guilty verdict, a shadow of doubt always hung over Sam Shepard, many people believing he killed Marilyn. The couple had one child, a son, Sam Reese, known as Chip, seen here with his dad and his second wife, Ariane. As a seven-year-old boy, Chip had been asleep down the hall the night his mother was beaten to death. My dad was innocent, there's been no doubt in my mind. And beyond his mother's brutal murder, Sam Reese said both he and the entire Shepherd family had been victimized as well. My grandmother committed suicide, my grandfather committed suicide, we've had three serious alcoholics and a drug addict in the family. This is the kind of thing these cases produce. By the late 1990s, Sam Reese Shepard believed times had changed again, and he could shed new light to prove his father was innocent, that he was telling the truth when he said he fought with the bushy-haired man not too far down that beach. The man Sam Shepard always said murdered his wife. What had changed was a brand new way to investigate criminal cases using DNA technology. We are now finding out back then that that people could be exonerated by DNA that were convicted by traditional evidence. Terry Gilbert represented the estate of Sam Shepard at a civil trial in the year 2000 that sought to have him declared innocent. Steve Dever represented the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office in opposing him. This is the first time the two attorneys have been back in court to discuss that third Shepard trial in the 19 years since it took place. I thought that the evidence was overstated and that the science didn't stand up to what they were claiming it would show.
Both Sam and Marilyn Shepard's bodies were exhumed for DNA testing, and then their DNA was compared to samples on evidence collected around the home, including in the murder room. Are you in the position that the DNA evidence does show a third person in that room? Now that was the breakthrough in the case. Gilbert says DNA showed the blood on a closet door was not Sam or Marilyn's. The blood on Sam's pants did not belong to Sam or Marilyn either. We could only try to exclude Sam as the contributor of various blood evidence. And we thought we were able to do that but it became very technical and very scientific. The prosecution hammered home that DNA evidence may tell you who did or did not leave a blood stain, but it can't tell you when a stain was left. And prosecutors argued that the crime scene itself was not properly sealed, making it hard to pinpoint whether some stains came from the night of the murder or not. So basically they were you know, like using the mistakes of the coroner's office to show that we couldn't prove our case. Prosecutors offered a different theory on what the crime scene revealed. It was a gruesome murder that was staged to look like a sexual assault. And then the crime scene being the house was staged to look like a theft or a drug theft. Still, F. Lee Bailey says the fact that any blood in the house is someone other than Sam or Marilyn's is significant. Standing at the site of the former Shepherd home, Bailey told us that was different than what prosecutors had argued in the first two Shepherd trials. I am now convinced that the blood in the Shepherd house, which the state always said was his, was not by DNA testing, which could not have been done as to either trial, but was before the civil case. At the third trial, the civil case, the Shepherd team argued that Richard Eberling, the Shepherd's former window washer, who was later convicted of a different murder, was the likely killer. Everling could not be identified as the source of the bloodstains in the house, but he couldn't be excluded either. Gilbert says a bloodstain from the porch was later, after the third trial, proved to be from Everling by DNA testing. Shepard always said he had struggled with a bushy-haired man down on the beach, but former prosecutor Devers says there's a problem. Everling testified in the second trial in a courtroom smaller than the room we're in here today came into that courtroom, Sam Shepard was sitting in the chair, had an opportunity to observe him. He walked right by him and Sam Shepard didn't jump up and down and say, hey, that's the bushy haired man. That's the guy who killed my wife. And Bailey testified at the third trial saying he didn't think Eberling was the killer. Instead, his theory was that the wife of the town's mayor, Spencer Houck, caught her husband having an affair with Marilyn Shepard that night and killed her for it and that Spencer Houck was the bushy-haired man Shepard wrestled with as he fled his home and later down on the beach. Bailey thinks a set of fireplace tongs was the murder weapon. None of the blows was fatal. She just bled out. None of them was struck with great force, which suggested a killer who was either a woman or a young boy. The question for the third jury was, was there enough evidence to declare Sam Shepard innocent? When they said no... Do hereby find four the defendant, the state of Ohio. Terry Gilbert's reaction said it all. I had invested emotionally in that case for almost 10 years at that point. All I did for years to the exclusion of my law practice. My father's life was destroyed by the state of Ohio. I will never forget that. I will never let you forget that. Even after he was found not guilty in 1966, Sam Shepard's life quickly declined. He would become a wrestler and would not live a long life. It was hard to figure out who Sam was at that point. His final tragic years when we conclude Sam Shepard, case closed. Bill Scheel, Fox 8 News. Flanked by his teenage son Chip on one side, his second wife Ariane and attorney F. Lee Bailey on the other. Sam, give her another kiss. Okay, thank you. Dr. Sam Shepard appeared to have his life back after Bailey won him an acquittal at his second trial in 1966. But now, 53 years later, Bailey tells us what people saw was an illusion. It was hard to figure out who Sam was at that point, and it was particularly hard for Sam to figure out who Sam was. Shepard had spent 10 years in prison after being convicted in 1954 of the brutal beating death of his pregnant wife, Marilyn, in their Lakeside Bay Village home. Shepard maintained an intruder he struggled with in the home and later down on the beach was the real killer, someone he described later as the bushy-haired man. Standing with us near the lake behind where the Shepard home once stood, 
Bailey said a decade in prison took quite a toll. Sam Shepard used to do 500 push-ups a day just to forget where he was. His second wife, Ariane, was from Germany. Her older sister had been married to Joseph Goebbels, Adolf Hitler's propaganda minister. She became a pen pal of Shepard's while he was in prison and later moved to the United States and married him, and she saw his decline. I never talked about his drug problem and his alcohol problem before he died because I always thought he could get out of it and he could start a new career. Initially, after prison, Shepard returned to being a surgeon. And he went right back into it, severed the iliac artery of a patient in a hospital in Youngstown, and the guy died. And his life at that point was falling apart, and it just kept falling. I don't think he just could, could make it uh, as, uh, uh, in the society that he inherited when he got out of prison. Terry Gilbert represented Sam Shepard's estate, as well as his son, Sam Reese, at a third trial, a civil case, in the year 2000. Gilbert was visibly shocked when a jury said new DNA results he had offered were not conclusive enough to show Shepard was not guilty. The Shepard family always maintained his first conviction, and the decade in prison that followed ruined the life of an innocent man who spiraled downward even after his release. The wrestling thing, you know, it's hard to understand, but it, he was like trying to be a caricature of what people wanted him to be. F. Lee Bailey says Shepard was a champion wrestler while in prison. After he got out and facing medical malpractice suits, Shepard struck up a relationship with a wrestling promoter, married the promoter's 19-year-old daughter, and started to wrestle as Killer Sam Shepard. The moniker he chose, the name Killer, does that say anything to you? The whole thing was silly from our perspective, from a guy trying to hang on to a little piece of life. He first wrestled in 1969, at one point reportedly drawing 4,000 spectators in Cleveland. His decline continued, though, until April 6, 1970, when Sam Shepard died in his Columbus area home at the age of 46. F. Lee Bailey was a pallbearer at his funeral. Sam did something that caused his heart to stop. We all speculate on many possibilities. Do you know what you think about it? Yes, I think it was an excess of pills. Unfortunately, any physician becomes an addict, has an open pipeline. He can write his own prescriptions. Sam Shepard's life never recovered from his decade in prison. In fact, Shepard later said that on the day he was found not guilty at his second trial in Cleveland in 1966, he had brought a gun into the courtroom to make sure he never went back to prison. Bailey, seated by Shepard, did not know at the time that he was armed. And I'm not sure the gun was loaded, I never asked him, that he would start a situation where he would be shot down. It's called suicide by cop. It's not all that uncommon. You could have been in the line of fire. No, no. If he'd had a gun in the courtroom that day and I knew it, he wouldn't have had the gun anymore. Yes, if he got in the gun battle I could never see coming. There is the thing called the wrong place at the wrong time. Was that the story of Sam Shepard's life? Was he a husband who was home asleep when he heard the sounds of his wife screaming and raced upstairs to confront her killer, who he later chased out onto the beach? Or was he her killer, who concocted a story to cover a murder? Three trials reached three different verdicts, guilty, then not guilty, and at the third trial, the civil case, not innocent. After Sam and Marilyn Shepard's bodies were exhumed for DNA testing for that third trial, Sam's body was cremated, and their son, Chip, who'd been a boy asleep down the hall the night his mother was killed, had his parents buried in the same crypt in Mayfield Heights. You may always get a debate about whether Sam Shepard killed Marilyn, whether there ever was a struggle with a bushy-haired man not far down this beach. But 65 years later, those debates, like the Shepard case itself, now belong to history.